Uh, hey, everybody. I don't usually do interviews, so this is kind of strange, but um, I've got a friend of mine here. Her name is Mallory, and she's going to be giving a presentation on feminism today uh, and kind of how that relates to Christianity. Is it biblically sound? All that kind of stuff. Um, and also how to talk to feminists nowadays. So I'll let her give a little introduction, and then we'll get started. Sure. Yeah, so as Julian said, my name is Mallory. Um, I have been a member of our local Rosho Christie chapter. Um, I go to NC State University, so we're involved with the chapter there, and I have been for the last four years or so. I'm in grad school right now for industrial engineering, so not necessarily anything philosophical, but this is a really big interest of mine and kind of a hobby to research some of these topics. So that being said, I'm not necessarily an expert on feminism. I haven't formally studied it in a university setting, but um, I have put a lot of time into this presentation and I've actually given it to two different Rosh and Christie chapters. So hopefully, mm -hmm. hopefully it's been refined a little bit. And I know Julian's heard it a couple of times, so he'll have some really good questions. But yeah. Yeah, I'll I think I think it'll be pretty good. Um, I'm surprised at how many engineers you see in apologetics. Uh, That's you true. don't see you don't see too many super high intellectual people. Not that they aren't there, but what? it'd be engineers like you, you know, making presentations about feminism, not the head of the women's studies department at a university, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. No, it's interesting. I think engineers tend to be a little bit more like willing to do the very cursory cursory level research whereas like those really yes. intellectuals are very like high up in the clouds of these like theoretical concepts and it doesn't necessarily make for a very relatable presentation well you're in grad school so you probably know how grad school makes people very specialized in one mm -hmm. particular area the smallest Absolutely. little minuscule part of one degree field yes so i think if you don't spend five years you know doing yeah. that and get in this little rabbit hole, then you're a lot more likely to do um, more general research. So uh, yeah, there you go. Awesome. Well, and you've presented twice, so you'll be fine. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, let's get started. Before I even go into this presentation, I like to give a little disclaimer, um, which is like three things. So first of all, I don't get to talk about this topic just because I'm a girl. So we're going to be looking at the ideology of feminism, and you don't have to be anybody particular to discuss an ideology. So just like Christianity is an ideology, um, and you don't have to be a Christian to talk about it, um, feminism is an ideology. So I'm not necessarily talking about it because I'm a feminist or just because I'm a girl. Um, and sometimes I see that mistake being made in culture, like you can't comment on this just because you are, you know, not part of this group or something like that. So. I am talking about this as hopefully an objective third party um, trying to find the truth of the matter as a Christian. So point number one, um, point number two is feminism is complicated. There is no feminist Bible out there that everybody's going back to and saying, this is where we ground our um, beliefs in and this is how we make decisions about how we should interact. Like, you know, the US has the constitution. We go back to that when we're making judicial rulings, but feminism doesn't have that. So that being said, you have a lot of different um, sex and areas of feminism, and a lot of people disagree very often in academics and in everyday life. So we'll get into some of those disagreements throughout this presentation. And then lastly, um, we're, I'm, so that being said about there is no feminist Bible or feminist constitution, um, the definition that we're going to build for feminism is kind of based on general consensus through multiple different articles, scholarly reports, journals, things like that, that I have kind of gleaned from for this presentation. So, you know, you might find a feminist who's like, that is not at all how you define feminism. Well, that's their opinion. So I'm just trying to build off of the general consensus. So that's my disclaimer. And so then the next question is, okay, um, I'm a Christian and I'm interested in apologetics um, and I'm interested in defending the faith through, you know, scientific, philosophical, historical evidence, things like that. Why on earth are we talking about a very cultural issue? And so for that, I have a little illustration here. So um, let's say that you are a traveler and you're moving to Greece. Um, you're a Christian, let's say, um, and you know that your job is to take the gospel with you wherever you go. Let's say you're going to Greece for work though, not necessarily as a missionary, but you could be. So given this information, um, you know that 80 to 90% of Greeks are Greek Orthodox. Um, you might want to ask yourself two questions if you know you're going into a culture where this is this ideology is very present. So you might say, am I Greek Orthodox? And by that, I mean, 
do my beliefs that I hold to be true about Christianity actually fall in line with Greek Orthodoxy? And I just didn't know it. Um, and I could be calling myself a Greek Orthodox. I just never thought about it. So like, what is the actual belief system? And then secondly, and this is kind of dependent on how you answer question one, how would you talk to someone who is Greek Orthodox? Let's say you disagree with them on some, some points. How would you discuss with them um, as a Christian concerned about their salvation? So that is a very simple example of, you know, why it's important to understand the cultural ideologies that are present wherever you live. So that being said, um, I found this statistic um, through a Pew Research study. This is an article, and I have the link for this in the presentation. But um, it says that 61% of U.S. women say that feminist describes them well. Um, and then some people see it as empowering, and other people see it as polarizing. So, like, there is still mixed messaging about it. But, like, a lot of women consider feminism to be something good and something that we should aspire to as a culture. Um, and so a lot of women you'll meet will say, oh, I am a feminist. So it's very important to learn how to talk to these people um, because you are likely to run into them if you live in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to this question then, are you a feminist? And then how do you talk to someone who is a feminist? Um, you can kind of clearly see that Again, you might run into a feminist, so you would want to ask, um, you would want to figure out where you fall in line with that issue and then figure out how to talk to them if you do happen to disagree with it. So um, yeah, that is basically our presentation today. And that brings us to our first question. So are you a feminist? Julian, what would you, what would you say to that? Uh, um, I said this the other day when you gave the presentation, um, I was talking to some of the students in there. Um, it depends on what you mean by feminist yeah, because there's absolutely. been multiple waves over the last century and they've they've pushed for different things um i'm not really an expert on the different waves i just know that they exist and kind of generally what they said mm -hmm. so yeah, i think it's a bit of ignorance for me i wouldn't be able to say one way or another i think i could definitely say i'm not part of the most recent wave of feminism because i don't i don't agree with a lot of the things that they say but yeah. maybe first wave i don't know i haven't really looked into it all that much. Or, well, we will definitely keep talking about that. So yeah, you pointed out, you're like, well, what do you mean by feminist? And that's kind of the framework I've given this presentation as we're looking to define feminism. You have to ask, what is it? Um, and then kind of three different sub questions you could ask are, what is the goal of feminism? What do you have to believe to be true about the world to become a feminist? And then what do you have to do to become a feminist? And, and the answer could have to some of these be nothing like you don't have to do anything to be a feminist you just need to believe x y and z or you just have to you know match with the goal of feminism or, or agree that's a good goal to have so um as i define these kind of keep these questions like in the back of your mind because they'll kind of be answered throughout the definition so um yeah in this is kind of an agenda here. We're gonna look at defining it three different ways. Then we're gonna look at some of the specific subsets of feminism or the specific types. And then we'll also look at some of the disagreements within the feminist movement. So starting off strong, let's just define it broadly. If you'll remember, um, I said we're gleaning from like a bunch of different sources to try to find the general consensus. So I picked out three things here um, that I think make feminism give it a good broad definition. So jumping right in, um, yeah, as I said, we're defining it broadly because there's many different types and nobody agrees. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so when I did my cursory research, almost every single article I read had this little disclaimer in the beginning that said, feminism is not about hating men. And so in all fairness to feminism, I chose to include that in this broad definition because that was something that every feminist seemed to be working against that seemed to be a common rumor that they felt was um you know hurting their movement or something so they were trying to dispel that with most of these articles so that was the first point um the second um so that was before we kind of got to these what i found to be common definitions that i pulled out so google says feminism just from a definition is the advocacy of women's rights on the basis of the equality of the sexes. Uh, Britannica says the belief in social, economic, and political equality of the sexes. And then the list goes on. I have a bunch here. Um, wow. And so, wow. Yeah, so obviously none of these are exactly the same. I mean, Google and Britannica probably have pretty similar ones, but, you know, 
Forbes says that it's equality, sexuality, and unconscious gender bias are the things that make up feminism. And I'm pretty sure they just listed those words and didn't explain how they kind of relate to one another. <laughs> so there's a huge variety in how these are defined, but uh, a key theme is the, the term equality. And so that was um, that was the next thing I included in this list. So it's not about hating men and it's about equality for women. Um, and so before we go any further, I thought, well, you know, with these two points, let's look at what the Bible says about these two things, right? Um, yeah, and so we know that this is now the goal of feminism. Um, you know, they say that where the patriarchy is no longer needed, where the freedom to choose, which is a little vague, or ending sexism and things like that. I will also point vague. out, yeah, also vague. Um, I will say that some people point out that equity is the goal, which means equal outcomes. Um, most people don't actually say equity. Um, it's probably trending a little bit right now because equity has very much so to do with the social justice movement. And so um, that is a that is a different, a slightly different topic, but we're just gonna stick with equality because that's what most people tend to say. Um, because equity is a whole nother discussion. So again, looking at now what the Bible says about this is um, really important before we go further because we've established what the goal is. Well, does that align with Christian values? Um, and so I have these two verses here. I'll just read the second one, um, but it says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free, nor is there male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And then the first verse is about um, don't show special attention to rich people or people that you perceive to be rich um, because you will then have become judges with evil thoughts is what it says. And so it is wrong to discriminate. The same um, chapter in James says, show no partiality. So I think it's pretty clear that the Bible says a lot about equality and that we should treat um, everyone as individual human beings with um, extreme worth because they're made in the image of God. So on those first two points of feminism, um, we can definitely agree as Christians. Um, and so a lot of times though, when I was reading these definitions, that's kind of where they stop. They're like, feminism is not about hating men and it's about equality of women and, and you know, reaching equal social status and being valued equally in the marketplace, things like that. Um, and they didn't really go on to elaborate any further what feminism actually was, but uh, in my research, I kind of found some implicit things that led me to uh, ask this next question, is, which is, how is feminism different from egalitarianism? If you just stop at this definition, you defined egalitarianism or even classical liberalism in kind of a economic sense. So egalitarianism is the doctrine that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities, not to be confused necessarily with the theology of egalitarianism, they're very similar, but we're not necessarily talking about like the biblical complementary complementarian versus egalitarian um, concept right here. We're just talking about the definition of the word egalitarianism. Um, and so that's what this is. And a lot of feminists probably don't realize but when they say those two things, they're actually defining this. So a great question to ask a feminist would be, oh, you know, what else do I have to do to become a feminist? Because um, you just define egalitarianism and maybe I identify or I would call myself an egalitarianist. Um, and so that would be the next question to ask. And so that brings us then to the philosophical belief of feminism, which is um, a little bit more of a, a structured way of defining it um, in the branch of philosophy. And it gives us that third point that we need to actually distinguish feminism from egalitarianism. So philosophical feminism. Um, it is an ethical position, which has a moral claim, which we just discussed. It says that men and women should be treated equally by the law. And we just discovered that the Bible is like, yeah, we're good with that. Um, but the second point would be though, is the empirical claim. And this is that kind of implicit claim that I was talking about that a lot of feminists don't realize that they are making or asserting that you have to believe to become a feminist. And that is that women are treated worse by the law than men. And I don't mean necessarily the legislative law, it could be like the cultural law or the cultural customs um, when I say law. So that is the empirical claim. And if you were to ask women, um, how what, what are some examples of women being treated um, worse by the law, they will probably give you quite a list. 
um, which I'll talk about in just a second here. So yeah, we now have our, our definition. It is not hating men, equality for women, and then the belief that women are treated disproportionately worse than men. And so, um, yeah, getting into then that point there, um, when you ask people what they mean, you're probably going to see some of these common examples. And again, this is not a list I have put together. I am just gleaning from the internet um, some common things that people cite as issues, um, either in the U.S. or the world. So sexual harassment, domestic violence, pay gap, um, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, and so <laughs> we have quite a list of horrible things here, some of which are, and then some of which I think would probably need a little bit more explanation. If you look at the last one, I believe mm -hmm. that Senator Elizabeth Warren said that economic systems of capitalism are systems of oppression and evidence of, um, you know, women being treated unequally. And so I would need a little bit more clarification on what she meant by that and how that was actually uh, treating women differently before I could, you know, accept that as an example. Mm -hmm. And so then that brings us to our, you know, back to this empirical claim. And as Julian, I'm sure you know, empirical claims require evidence. So to believe any of those things that were just um, said, some of them can be true, right? Um, women can be discriminated against, of course, in almost probably any society. Um, mm -hmm. So, but you need to prove that it happens and that it is an intense problem for me to say that women are treated worse by the law than men. Um, so I cannot hold this philosophical feminist belief unless I see evidence for um, for for this. So again, looking back at that list, just some suggestions for things to ask if people were to give these to you. Like, what are you talking about? What do you mean by the pay gap? Um, where are you talking about? That is a huge, huge point. Obviously, there's different cultures all over the world. The United States and Saudi Arabia are two incredibly different countries with different cultures and different customs. Um, some of these things could be issues in one country and not in another. And then ask yourself, kind of as I said, is this a moral issue I stand behind? It, would it be wrong if you know women were sexually harassed in the workplace? Well, as a Christian, of course that's wrong. So yeah, I stand behind that, but is there evidence of this happening kind of systemically or ongoing that's not being addressed or being um, prosecuted by the legislative law? Um, and so then, and this is probably kind of a hot topic, especially in the more conservative Christian movement, I would say that it is possible by this very broad definition, it is possible to be a feminist in some countries, but not in others, just because the broad definition um, would kind of encompass, obviously, um, instances of discrimination in other countries where women actually are undervalued and they don't have the same rights as men. Um, and so- could you yeah, sorry, could you give an you Could you give an example of a country where you could be a, a feminist versus one where you probably couldn't? I mean, I think places uh, like in the Middle East is really common for women to be, you know, not treated with the same dignity as men. Um, mm -hmm. Like it wasn't until very recently that women could get driver's license in Saudi Arabia. And so maybe if I went to Saudi Arabia right. and I saw things like this and I saw women being um, oppressed, if you will, then I might say, yeah, well, I, I don't think that's right. I don't think it's right that women should have to do these things or they're arrested and things like that. So maybe I'm a feminist, and I'm not saying I am, but maybe I'm a feminist in Saudi Arabia, but in where I live in the United States and North Carolina, I don't see women being oppressed. So I would not probably call myself a feminist here. Um, okay. Yeah, I think, I think that's something that a lot of conservatives aren't willing to meet the feminist halfway on. They're like, no, we don't, don't want anything to do with this term. Um, but if you're defining it like this, then as a Christian, I think you can stand behind it. But as we'll see throughout this presentation, this isn't all there is to feminism. There's, there's quite a bit more. I think that's actually a great transition to my next slide which is this is a broad definition but feminism kind of encompasses some other ideologies that we're about to talk about that go beyond um that go beyond just these three beliefs so that's understandably why some conservatives some christians are hesitant to put this label on themselves so that brings us to the political ideology julian you mentioned the waves of feminism and that's kind of mm -hmm. where um this 
thought process and this historical feminism kind of come in. So again, political feminism is just a social movement um, trying to generate change in the laws of the land. Um, specifically, we're looking at America because that's kind of where feminism started. Um, or Western culture, I should say. And then, yeah, they're just trying to determine what rules should a society operate by because they see the current rules as being oppressive to women. And so, yeah, there's been conflict through these decisions. And then also, it's really important to remember that there were feminists, that should be plural, there were feminists beyond their wave um, in every period of time. You had writers in the first wave who aligned much more with third wave feminists. And so when you're reading it, if you're confused, you're like, wait, why is she saying this? That's not what women were fighting for at the time. It's probably because she was thinking ahead or more progressively. And so now let's look at um, kind of the brief history of each of these waves and some of the defining features. So it can be divided pretty clearly into four waves. And then we'll talk about the possibility of a fifth wave now. Um, but the first wave was in, started in about the 1850s and kind of ended with the Equal Rights Amendment or the 19th Amendment. And this um, this period of time, women were, or the suffragettes, as they were often called, wanted the right to vote and own property, you know, businesses and things like that. Um, but it's important to note that women were still largely in the home care. They, they just wanted to vote. They wanted to become moms. And, or, but they still wanted to become moms and stay at home and take care because that's kind of how culture and society needed them to be. Um, in that time with a very like kind of agrarian culture. But then you have the, you have the World Wars, World War II, and then the break of the was invented um, right before the second wave. And this is a really important historical um, advent that is probably not thought of as being as big as it was, but it really was for feminism. And you can kind of see how the waves follow it because with the advent of birth control, um, you have, the, sorry, um, you have, sorry, I need to collect my thoughts. You're good. <laughs> With the advent of birth control, you have women now no longer having to choose between a career and a family. Um, so women could hold off on having kids or choose when they have them. Um, and that allowed them to pursue careers and enter the workplace more. And as they entered the workplace, they realized they were facing stereotypes that were not helping them out, let's just say, you know, common during this time that women um, in the office place were considered secretaries and not much more than that. They're always note takers, things like that, um, instead of actual productive, you know, people in the business world. So, so women didn't like that and they wanted freedom from that. And then at the same time, you kind of have like the 1960s hippie culture, you know, love and peace and the sexual revolution um, came about at this time. So there's a lot of, I I would put forth that the birth control pill being invented kind of, um, you know, jettisoned us as a culture into this sexual revolution, second wave feminism, just because um, sexuality and sexual activity were not as hindered um, because the consequences for sexual activity were, could be delayed or put off with the birth control pill. So that is the second wave feminism. And that ended in about the 80s or the 90s, which brings us to the third wave of feminism, which some people would still probably consider themselves to be in today. I would argue that we're in a fourth wave, but the third wave um, was really about this ideology of intersectionality. Um, they said that the first and second wave of feminism really only included white middle-class women. It did not include um, you know, women of color, or you know the poor people in society it was only for the white women so we wanted to um you know expand feminism to include everyone you start seeing slogans like girl power and girl bossing come in and then also the incorporation of lgb issues so often lgb advocates at the time were often probably feminists um and so they were looking for freedom from gendered stereotypes um, not as much just sexual stereotypes, gender stereotypes. And so then that brings us to the fourth wave, which is um, where we're struggling to define even what a woman is. What does it mean to be a woman? Um, you know, today you'll hear in society, you don't have to wear pink to be a woman, but also if you wear pink and wear dresses, you are a woman. Um, so it's, it's really kind of this disconnect with 
um, what what makes a woman a woman. You have events like the Me Too movement um, or Gamergate was a big event kind of in the, the video game space. And then all in all, you just see a huge rise in internet activism, especially with Twitter um, and things like that growing in popularity in the 2010s. And then, um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Rosaria Butterfield is, she's kind of, I guess, getting more famous now in the apologetics realm. Um, she was a professor at Syracuse for a while. I think this was okay. actually back in the 90s, like in the height of all the activism stuff. Okay. Um, she was a lesbian at that point and was really into not just feminism, but, you know, gay rights and all that kind of stuff. And she was saying it was like the activism was a part of her sexuality, which is kind of strange. Um, but I see that a lot with not just people in the LGB sphere, but in feminism in general nowadays, it seems like um, certain people think as being, being a woman has to include some kind of activism to fight against the system or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you see that a lot or yeah. do you see it? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, I saw somebody kind of making a funny, if you will, um, asking women if they felt that they were um, being discriminated against because there wasn't equality between women, um, or there weren't equal numbers of men and women, and they called it offshore interrogation, and so these women are viewing torture, and the guy was like, yeah, like, why, like, do you feel discriminated against because you don't have equal opportunity to pursue that? She's like, well, I don't really want to participate in that career. And he's like, or is that your social program, right? So <laughs> you're socially programmed if you are not fighting against feminism because you have just accepted these stereotypes about yourself as a woman um, and you're being oppressed, but you might not even realize it, uh, which is a little bit, um, dare I say, culty. Um, to kind that of that say. sounds like so, gaslighting. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's only an issue if you're, or you're only truly a woman if you're fighting against something that we're telling you is an issue, even if you yeah. haven't experienced it. I've, the, a lot of this overlaps with critical theory and especially critical race theory that you see a lot nowadays. Um, I did a lot of research into that. And it just... To briefly explain, a critical theory is opposed to a regular historical theory, because um, historical theories, and actually I'm not sure that that's the right term, but generally theories try to understand the world as it is. You say there's this theory about the world, if it turns out not to be true, then I throw out the theory. If it turns out to be true, then perhaps this theory becomes a law. But with critical theories, they're not really even theories, because it, the word the word theory uh it implies that you're trying to figure out exactly what's right about the world but critical theory is try to change the world as it is and i was thinking about that when you were talking about um in one of the slides earlier about it being a constant push you know progressive progressing forward constantly moving ahead yeah. um there's just such an emphasis on trying to make the world better in some way and you know who who gets to decide how the world is better we don't know right. but there's there's so much of a push on trying to progress somewhere that there there never seems to be a place to stop like yeah. we've got we've got four waves of feminism here perhaps after the first wave many of the women there were satisfied mm -hmm. and were totally fine with just you know being able to vote and own property we don't yeah. know well, actually, we probably do. We can go back and read what they said. But yeah. now we're on our fourth wave. Who knows where it's going to keep going from here? And yeah. now you see it breaking down even what it means to be a woman. So yeah. I think maybe we're progressing too far. Exactly. I think the first and second waves were more so concerned with equality. And people still say that now, even though we are definitely in the fourth wave. Um, but in the third and fourth wave, with the intersectionality and, and critical race theory and critical theory things, things like that coming about, you start seeing the focus more on equity as the end goal. And I think, mm -hmm. mm, I think some feminists who maybe aren't scholars don't really think about what the end goal of this is um, and what that actually looks like. So it's, I, I agree. A lot of, a lot of times now we're starting to define history as only um, 
how you experience it. Like your who you are and your experiences in right. life validate what you can talk about and what you can say, which is why I put the disclaimer in the beginning. Like I don't get to talk about this just because I'm a girl and I've quote unquote experienced oppression wherever I am because you know, the patriarchy is at rule, which we'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah, that's kind of, it's it's definitely, you can see kind of the political discourse changing along or moving with feminism um, mm-hmm. as we approach now, which brings us actually to our fifth wave. Um, and really the fifth wave is being defined by the transgenderism movement um, with things like you know, LGBT issues now being incorporated. So what is a woman and are transgender women um, allowed into the feminist movement because biologically they are males, right? So some feminists have an issue with it and others don't and others are just kind of confused because they're like, well, women's issues, but also we want to fight oppression. So where do we fall on this? And so it's, it's being hashed out right now in, in feminist circles, I would say. Yeah. Um, so, real quick, real quick. <laughs> if you could go back a second, I just noticed this. Um, you've got on the first three waves, it's a general like decade assumption of where this was. But <laughs> in the fourth wave, it starts in 2012. Do you remember what it was in 2012? The Me Too movement. I believe that okay. was the Me Too movement. That was okay. kind of huge. Obviously, if you'll remember with um, I'm, the name of the justice is escaping me. But um, yeah. That, that huge movement and all the you also have literature coming out like the handmaid's tale i believe in like 20 in, in like the 2015 somewhere around there um, the handmaid's okay. tale made its way to hulu um which is a huge which um was really inspired like a lot of the imagery from that book was used in the me too movement with like these head coverings and stuff right, and right. Really wear. so like you kind of have these like the the political discourse matching up with the literature and the academic discussions on what feminism is in the fourth wave so yeah that's another thing in these circles the it doesn't matter if a writing is non-fiction or fiction um the writer can use it to kind of use it as a lens to see the world in and then that just yeah. becomes reality. So yeah. it, that's kind of how it is, I think, with The Handmaid's Tale because it's a fictional book, right. but people treat it as if it actually happened. And I mean, I would say the conservatives do the same thing with things like Animal Farm in 1984. So sure. it's not that there can't be truths in this. It's it's obviously an allegory for the world these books were written right. as, but it's, is, it, is it based in truth and do we actually understand human nature as progressing like that? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I had to read that book for a class um, in college, and it was very interesting. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, <laughs> um, just due to the graphic nature of it. The ideas are interesting to consider, but it was very graphic, so <laughs> I didn't appreciate it. But, yeah, um, definitely a lot of a lot of change has happened since the first wave and women just trying to get the right to vote. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that brings us to our third slash fourth slash fifth wave. Like I said, can't really tell which one we're in at this point. A feminist me could identify with any one of these waves or a combination of the issues from each of these waves. Um, like I said, it's constantly changing. We've we've talked about that a lot. Um, and so again, just here are some commonly cited issues that you'll hear today. Um, things like rape culture, sexual harassment, and body shaming or fat phobia are things right now um, that women say they experience disproportionate to the male population. Um, And so that is all, um, we've talked about that. We've talked about how you have to have evidence for these things. Like, what do you mean when you're talking about these things? And is there evidence for that? But um, where feminism kind of takes a turn is when they start trying to say, why do we see these things in culture? And so they've come up with several different frameworks and lenses for viewing all of the discrimination that they say they see in culture, and those are listed here. So we have um, intersectionality, gender stereotypes, and the patriarchy. And all of these things kind of work together, um, and we're going to take a look at each one of these. Um, but there are some, I would but where there are some issues with some of these um, explanations or these frameworks um, that maybe don't align with biblical principles as a whole. And so just as a side note, um, this is called methodological feminism, which is basically trying to find the the reason or the method by which people discriminate against um, women and like trying to understand why they do that. So um, 
that brings us to intersectionality and this video here that I want to play that kind of explains it, but it's also really important to hear what they're saying and um, kind of respond to this in a biblical way. So. Hey, Betsy, what's the long face? Hi, Dave. I just got off the phone with my wife. She is having issues at work still. Oh no, what's happening? Well, as I'm sure you know, my wife is Hispanic. She moved to the United States from the Dominican Republic many years ago. Even though she's lived in the US for many years, people are sometimes still hard on her because of her accent. Wow, is that why there's issues at work? Well, that's one of the reasons. Her boss seems to be passing her up for opportunities and she's just had it. She thinks her boss doesn't like her accent and after he found out that she was married to a woman, the tension at work got even higher. I feel so awful for her. I wish I knew how to help. Has she talked to human resources about her concerns? We have discussed that and I think it will be the next step. It's just tough for her in this situation because she isn't sure where his hostility is coming from. What do you mean by that? Have you heard about the theory of intersectionality? No, actually. What is that? Intersectionality is the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group, regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Hmm. Could you explain that a little more simply? Sorry about that. Basically, it's the idea that we are not just one identity. We have many parts of us. You, myself, and my wife are all part of the LGBTQ community, right? Yes, and my boyfriend too. Yeah, exactly. Except we all four belong to other groups that make us who we are. Unfortunately, some of us are part of other minority groups that are also discriminated against. My wife, for example, is a Hispanic, lesbian woman. These different points of her intersect and it creates double and even triple discrimination at times. Jeez, Betsy, I hadn't even thought about that before. That's all right, Dave. We have spent so much time focusing on segmented groups to promote diversity, but it goes so far beyond that. When my wife or anyone else that belongs to multiple minority groups feels discriminated against, it is difficult to understand the cause or even how to approach the situation. My wife, for example, isn't sure if she is experiencing homophobia, sexism, or racism, or even a combination. Wow, that is really sad when you think about it. Intersectionality isn't something I'd ever considered before, but you're right. Even though we're all a part of the LGBTQ community, none of us experience life in the same way. Exactly, Dave. Intersectionality is the belief that oppressions are interlinked and cannot be solved alone. This is the pivot of diversity. The more we take the time to get to know and understand people from all walks of life and stop trying to fit ourselves and others into one category, the better off we will be as a society. I agree, Betsy. I hope things get better for your wife. We've made great strides in universal acceptance, but there's still a long way to go. Thank you, Dave. I hope so too. And I definitely agree. It is important to truly listen to others and examine our own privileges. I hope we can find a solution with her boss and for anyone else experiencing these issues, both within the workplace and out. Yeah, so Julian, I really want to get your thoughts on that video. Um, I think it's funny that you have this like really deep talk on all these issues and then it's bookended by some nice ukulele music. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yes. I think that's funny every time I see the stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, this stuck out to me. So I've seen this video multiple times now. But mm -hmm. every time this thing sticks out to me where she says towards the end, um, if we just understand each other better and we get along um, and you stop trying to fit each other into all these categories or groups or whatever, yeah. then things will be better overall. Yeah. But in in doing so, she's creating her own groups. Because she's saying it's better to do this thing and not this thing. So now we have a division between what's good and what's bad. And that's putting people into the groups. 
Because if you just understand what everybody else is doing and you try not to put anybody else in groups, you're now in this group she's created of better people versus yeah. worse people. Yeah. So it seems like you can't really escape that because yeah. in trying to get rid of the groups of people, she's creating her own groups. Yeah. Honestly, what she said kind of contradicts with the whole idea ideology of intersectionality in the first place. She said, you know, I wish we would try to stop label each other labeling each other and putting them in groups as you just said um yeah. but that's what intersectionality does it says look at the boxes that you check off and figure out right. what ways that you could be discriminated against and so that is something honestly she kind of contradicted herself there and i think a lot of people um yeah I, I think they like the idea of not putting people in boxes but also they really like the idea of putting people in boxes because it <laughs> helps you figure out what they would call like systems of oppression right yeah Another yeah, thing the, to point out. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, well, maybe you were about to say this, but the intersectionality part where she said she could be experiencing one, two, or th all three types of oppression at the same time, mm -hmm. and then that she wasn't sure which type that she was experiencing with the potentially being passed up for a promotion. Um, I think it would be obvious to tell what kind of oppression that you're experiencing in that situation. Yeah. Like if it's, if it's racism, somebody's going to make a comment about your race, probably. Yeah, if probably. it's about sexism, someone's going to make a comment about your sex. Like, I think it should be pretty easy to, to, to determine at least yeah. where to start with that. Well, that brings us to a conversation then, which is like microaggressions. Um, and That's with true. that, you don't have, you can't figure out exactly what um, what people are, why are people making these snide little comments to you? And it's because yeah. of some deep seated hatred towards this person or, you know, unconscious like kind of racism. Yeah. Unconscious bias, things like that. Yeah. Um, and so you have to kind of agree with those two things to even, you know, start to understand the framework of intersectionality. And I, I think another thing that's really important for the Christians to point out is like intersectionality, like what she just explained could totally be true. You could discriminate against someone because they are a different gender and you know a different race than you that is more than possible the the issue is when you adopt that and you view that as a framework for how you as a certain identity you view the world and you view how people look at you um and that's yeah, yeah that's kind of the next oh, no, I'm playing that again <laughs> that's kind of the next slide here um, it's like taking it on to a personal level is where I see the divide between Christianity and um, Christianity and like feminism through the framework of intersectionality. Bef before you go on to this, I had a question about that actually with feminism and in intersectionality. You were saying it's kind of hard to, to tell which wave of feminism we're in right now, mm -hmm. but clearly we have all these aspects of intersectionality and emphasis on racism and sexism and things like that. Um, do you think it's something that has all that stuff set aside from feminism for a second, all this intersectionality stuff, the LGBTQ, all that, do you think that has kind of come uh, in its own path on a different way and it's on a collision course with feminism? Or do you think feminism kind of brought all that stuff along with it over the past de few decades? I think, I think it was, I think they kind of collided at some point. If you'll remember the third wave is when intersectionality became a topic. It's also when it, the term became popularized, I think, um, right. which was like the early 2000s. But you kind of had like, it, it seemed like she, she mentioned this in the video. She's like, we've made such siloed efforts. So like feminism or the civil rights movement, like they, I think those two things honestly are what actually collided to create this intersectionality because I think intersectionality was born a little bit more from people who looked at racism as an issue, but they also like racism and women mm -hmm. were kind of mm -hmm. the issue that gave birth to intersectionality. Um, yes. And so yeah, I, I I think they kind of collided in the, you know, early, the 90s, early 2000s kind of things um, yeah. to produce what we have today. With those, with the intersectional side of it, you have a lot of intellectuals in the 80s and 90s, and even before then in the 60s and 70s, but to a lesser degree, who are kind of writing all these books and these papers and things in universities, kind of insulated from the world around them, I think. Mm -hmm. And that really became, to use an overused term, it became an echo chamber, really. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have all these ideas bouncing off each other and, and 
um, being contained within the university, the higher up university sphere. Um, and then you kind of have the general racism, sexism debate from the civil rights movement and things like that happening out in the quote unquote real world. Mm -hmm. I think at some point in the nineties, probably they collided and then you had a more general layman racism and feminist movement colliding with all the really highly intellectual, really very specific stuff from the universities. And now we have this combination where you can't really tell what the difference is between feminism and the intersectionality stuff. It's all kind of lumped together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, intersectionality has become a framework to view all of these political or social issues that we're seeing, mm -hmm. including racism, the LGBT feminist, feminist movement and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely on the rise and it, it honestly does have a lot of ties to, you know, the social justice movement and things like that as well, um, mm -hmm. which can then be traced back to more Marxist ideas and things like that. So it, so it has some roots in um, economics as well with like how societies should structure and, and be op and operate and stuff. Um, so it, it, it does affect, and I think that's why you see a lot of these conversations happening at a political level um, between between you know because obviously there's policies about this that affect people who live in everyday society so yeah, yeah. But as another note it's interesting like the bible gives us a measuring stick we know what's right and what's wrong and we know like if we're making progress towards something we we can say like okay we're good now like we have mm. we have conquered this hurdle of let's say racism or something like that, like, or close to, right, within society. Society is now less racist than they used to be. That is good. But with, I think, with the feminist movement and just activism in general today, they're always pushing for more. Um, and they've never, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard a feminist say, like, yeah, we're doing good. Like, I've heard feminists say, I don't know, it might be worse for women today with microaggressions and stuff like that. I'm like, really? I, I mean, you know, women in the 1930s couldn't vote and they couldn't own property and stuff. Like, obviously we have made some strides, um, right. but I don't think women want to admit that, that for some reason, because then there's nothing to fight for. But yeah. 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 Nothing to progress to. Yeah. So, I mean, we kind of talked about it, but um, you knew that victimhood was going to come up with this Whole intersectionality thing it's, it's when you take yeah. this on as a framework for viewing yourself um you see yourself as a victim the hispanic woman in that video you know this is a made-up video with a made-up person right but i'm gonna assert that she never considered did she even deserve a promotion like is she good at her job was she doing what needed to like get to that next step no she just looked at like the boxes that she's put herself into and said oh it's because of this that i didn't make it forward um right. There's a huge difference between being a victim and seeing yourself as a victim. You can be a victim and see yourself as a victim, and that's called like pity or <laughs> self self wallowing in your in your sorrows. You can be a victim and not see yourself as a victim, which is um, like something I think people would call heroic. Or you can just see yourself as a victim and not be a victim, and people would say that you're pandering or looking for attention at that point. Um, yeah. And so I think we see a combination of being a victim and seeing yourself as a victim or not even being a victim and just seeing yourself as a victim today um, with this intersectionality thing. Um, a quote I really liked was the foremost victim of human history, Jesus, never adopted the victim mentality. Truly, like mm. he took on the sin of the world and he never, um, never once saw himself and said, oh, woe is me. Um, yeah. He 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 was a victim and, and like I said, didn't take on that victim mentality. And that is most certainly something that Christians should aspire to. And I'll talk about that more in a second. Yep. Um, yeah, oh, here's the verses. I'll read this one. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. So it's literally talking about Christ didn't complain mm -hmm. when he went to the cross um, for us, very unjustly so. Um, and so we, as Christians, we're called to endure. Um, the next verse here calls us to glory in our sufferings, um, because it produces all of these things. Um, all of these fruitful spirits or fruitful um, outcomes. So 
that is what the Bible says. And, and this is where I see feminism and Christianity taking the biggest turn here, because the world says to see yourself as a victim and that there's nothing you can do about it, which is just really sad. If you think about it, there's nothing you can do about yeah. your status. But the Bible says that you do not see yourself as a victim and to even rejoice at oppression. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I think an important thing to remember just in general is that every human being is a sinner on this earth, except Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. And so when we start blaming one subgroup, you start seeing some problems. I talked about that a little bit more. Um, one thing I did want to point out here, though, um, was kind of when it says rejoice in oppression or, um, you know, endure through perseverance. The Bible doesn't say not to stand up for yourself, though. Um, the story in Acts 16 is of Paul. He's about to be beaten and he reminds um, the, I guess, the guards that are about to do this. He's like, um, I'm a Roman citizen and by law, you can't do this to me. Uh, and so they mm -hmm. were, they let him go. Now, Paul didn't have to do that. He could have just taken the beating because it is a good thing to suffer for Christ, technically. But he chose to stand up for himself and say, no, like, according to your law, I'm going to say, like, no, don't, please don't do this to me. So there, yeah. I think the Bible and Paul is, I think all does an example. Um, and that story was written as an example for Christians that you can stand up for yourself. It does, but also if you stand up for yourself and it doesn't work, you don't, you're not a victim at that point. Um, yep. It is a good thing. So yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that, Julian? Um, it plays into a lot of other conversations with not being a wet blanket as I say or not being a doormat you know mm -hmm. um, you don't let people just walk all over you um, but I think there's also times when you are like Christ was wrongly convicted of something or wrongly accused of something and you still choose to go through the punishment or whatever mm -hmm. um, for the sake of God's glory and for the sake of um, kind of being a role model, I guess, for other people and saying, you know, yeah. I'm bigger than this. I understand that it's wrong, but I'm still going to yeah. go through with it for the benefit of other people. Yeah, absolutely. There's still a place for that, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, certainly that's called sacrifice. And yeah. again, if you're choosing to sacrifice yourself, you've chosen that. So once again, don't be a victim. Don't complain about what you chose. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, as I said, it creates a them against me mentality or them against us. And you start assigning all of the sin that is on the world to this one subset of people or one group that isn't in your camp. Um, and that's when you start forgetting that every human being is a sinner and we're actually all unique. And we all also have sin um, that works together to cause to cause problems often. Um, it's not just one group. It's not just the men causing all the problems for the women because women right. also cause problems too in society. <laughs> um, so the next thing um, that the feminist would say causes this huge inequality in society would be like sex or gendered stereotypes. Um, and so I just listed some of the questions that, that they asked, like, is pink only for girls? Are, can only men be pastors or all ladies in the office? Are they just secretaries? Um, the last one was an Amazon commercial that came out earlier this year and it showed a woman and she had like facial hair. Um, so the question is, well, is facial hair only for men? Is that just some sort of gendered stereotype that is holding women down, right? Like, you know, women had to wear skirts back then. Well, they couldn't run as fast because they had these big skirts around their legs. Like that's holding them down. Like they, they look at this as kind of a framework for, for seeing the issues that we experience. And so I just want to point out here that like Christians have some of these same questions um, and it falls into the theological debate of complementarian versus egalitarian view of men mm -hmm. and women in the Bible. To summarize very, very briefly, um, complementarian basically says that men and women have different roles but are equal in value, whereas egalitarian says that men and women are equal in value, of course, but they have very similar roles or they can fulfill the same roles. Um, and so that's kind of a theological debate that Christians have, and that's how they answer some of these questions. Um, yeah, so, but still, like, you don't have to get into that theological debate to know how to treat people as a Christian. Um, we're simply called to not show partiality and treat everybody, um, at, love your neighbor as yourself, right? 
I didn't say what kind of neighbor you had, whomever. Um, we're called to love people and not show partiality. And then um, and just actually, another, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, when oh, someone sorry. asked Jesus uh, who, who his neighbor is, one of the Jews asked him that. He mm -hmm. used the illustration of the good Samaritan. Mm, right. It's like the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Those, those were their enemies. And he's like, yeah. that's your neighbor. So yeah. not only is it just people that you like, but it's people that you hate as well. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that in biblical times, people probably thought less about these social issues as they had other things to worry about a little more. Yes. But that's yes. why the gospel was so radical in that time. It's because Jesus called these people together and said, no, you're going to love each other. He put Matthew, the tax collector who betrayed his country, um, together with um, Simon, or Simon the Zealot who yeah. was on the opposite camp and wanted to overthrow Rome. And he said, no, you're going to be part of my 12 followers and you're going to have to get along. Like that was very yeah. radical. And he said, no, we're not. We're treating people as human beings. Um, right. Yeah. And so the Bible very clearly upholds the dignity of human life. Um, and kind of as a side note to this, just point out if people have this huge, there's this huge misconception that the Bible um you know, is calls women slaves or subservient or something like that. But I just like to point out that there are lots of women in the Bible who did not just fulfill the role of like mother. Um, obviously, Mary was a mother. There's plenty of mothers in the Bible, but there's also judges and prophetesses and queens and like the Proverbs 31 woman was a businesswoman and a landowner. You see all these different roles and you see these women. Um, fulfilling their duties and being faithful mm -hmm. to God in these roles and God used them. So it's not, um, as men and women, we aren't called to specific things. Um, I mean, as uh, individuals instead are called to specific roles in their own lives. So the last framework that you'll often hear, um, feminists using to kind of describe again, the inequality that we see in society would be this overarching term, uh, the patriarchy. And so this plays hand in hand with kind of the intersectionality conversation, but basically the patriarchy is defined as a system of society or government in which men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it. So that's what, you know, Google defines the patriarchy as. Um, and of course, we have seen this in history. Women couldn't always vote in America, things like that. There, Of course, this has happened. Um, and then the problem then becomes when you assign, once again, all of the blame um, or all of the sin in the world to the system. When you say the patriarchy is the reason for every injustice that the world has ever experienced, you that's a mischaracterization of like humanity and, and what God has said to be true about sin in the world and how we as Christians are supposed to respond to it. So um, obviously we know that all problems in the world can actually be attributed to the fall when um, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And it was their sin that brought down on everybody, not just the men. Um, yeah, we all deserve the blame for sin. And then once again, when you use the patriarchy, if, especially if you are a woman, um, you can um, start assigning all of the blame and sin in the world um, to the patriarchy, see yourself as a victim, um, which we just discussed was um, not a biblical mindset. Okay, so that was defining feminism. And I know we kind of took a lot of twists and turns there with those definitions, but truly that is kind of what feminism en encompasses nowadays. Um, but as I said, this is a, there's lots of disagree disagreements and subsets within feminism. Um, and so we're going to look at some of those briefly. So I called them spinoffs, but Basically, you have a term called radical feminism, which is obviously a little different from regular feminism. And basically, um, it, it has an extreme emphasis on the patriarchy. And it, it really does say that all society's problems are rooted in this. And the solution to that is that we need an entire revolution to fix the society. We need like the civil rights movement times 10 to actually get rid of the patriarchy that is so ingrained in our culture and history as um, as humanity. So that's radical feminism. Um, you have intersectional feminism, which just encompasses intersectionality. Um, it really takes into account those systems of oppression. Um, you have social feminists, which say that 
the patriarchy and capitalism are the root of all societal problems and that socialism is the solution for equality between the sexes um, and humanity. And then you have liberal or social feminism, which is a little different than it might sound. Basically what a liberal feminist would have to say is that men and women have differences and it's actually wrong and it's not feminist for women to start becoming like men. Um, and I kind of have an example of this later, because um, in the second wave, you kind of have this this debate, should women start acting like men and um, or should they not? Should they remain different and feminine, if you will? So, yeah, that brings us to the disagreement. So in each wave, there was a disagreement. Um, the first wave or a main disagreement, I should say, the first wave was um, should women be included in the draft? Men said, okay, you want the right to vote. That's a responsibility. You should also take on the responsibility of, um, you know, being called up to war. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, as you know, women aren't, as of today, included in the draft, but that was a conversation at the time because that would tr be true equality for women also to be included in the draft. So our law in America still recognizes there is some difference between men and women under the law um, in that they we are excluded from the draft. Um, this is the second wave is when we see that liberal feminism versus the more radical feminism. Um, that is where women, some women said we shouldn't become like men. Other women were like, no, we're going to become like them. The pantsuit is kind of an example of this. You have the big shoulder pads and these baggy pants that kind of give women a little bit more of a masculine frame. And some women really didn't like that. They're like, no, we don't have to dress like men, become like men to be seen as equal. Right. Um, so, you know, as a Christian, you might say, well, how does the Bible answer these questions? And again, it falls under that complementarian versus egalitarian debate within Christianity. So if you are a Christian and you figure out which side you're on, you can probably answer some of these questions. But that's a little outside the scope of this presentation. Uh, but it is important to say, like, yeah, as Christians, we have some of these same questions. We're, we're not dogmatically saying that women can never wear pantsuits or that women should only wear pantsuits, right? Uh, there, there is room for discussion with some of these things. You also have Christians who are very dogmatic, sadly, and will say things like, I've seen, I've seen a video of a sermon of this, of a okay. pastor saying to his church that women should not wear jeans in church. Mm -hmm. and just being very animated about it and the guys in the in the crowd were like yeah yeah this is great yeah it's like okay there's way bigger issues even if you just want to talk about the roles of women in church mm -hmm. there's way bigger issues than yeah. wearing jeans in church absolutely that's yeah. the trad wife movement i think is a mischaracterization of christianity at times because you don't see all women in the bible just being stay-at-home moms right, right. Also, the trad wife is a very 1950s thing. Like women in ancient times had to work in the fields and they didn't just stay at home cooking and cleaning in the that's kitchen. True. Like that's, true. that's not necessarily, I'm not saying that like you can't be a traditional wife and stay at home, but this culture of mm -hmm. trad wife does not, is not necessarily what the Bible preaches. I said um, this the other day as well. I can't remember if it's in Luke 8, it might be, but Jesus is traveling around and preaching the gospel with the disciples. And it says that many women were following them and supporting them out of their own means. Mm -hmm. So the men weren't even working. The women yeah. were providing the money. Yeah. The men were just preaching the gospel because that was the more important thing at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the women were just, they were not stay at home moms. They were mm -hmm. financial supporters. Yeah, there's like five women mentioned by name, I think maybe an act somewhere. And I think those are said to be some of the financial supporters of mm -hmm. Jesus's ministry or the disciples and apostles ministry. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Um, okay. With the third and fourth wave, you start seeing the rise of like sexuality and they have questions like, is something like porn liberating for women or not? Um, what like the objectification of women is really seen to be a sin, but you kind of have this, like, I should be able to wear whatever I want and be as um, promiscuous as I want. And nobody should treat me as an object, even though they're yeah. dressing um, in a way that maybe would suggest they're looking for a certain level of attention. Um, in the fourth wave, you have this transgenderism debate. Should trans women be included in the movement or not? Um, again, I will say Christianity has a lot to say about this disagreement in the, the third, fourth wave movement. Um, I think I listed them here. 
says that any type of lust outside of a marriage between a man and a woman is sinful. Um, men are called to respect women and women are called to respect men too. Um, husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a, a while. And then also just that Christians in general should dress in a spirit of modesty. I think that applies to men too. It, it certainly seems to be a bigger issue for women or something that women tend to, to maybe struggle with a little bit more. So it's often said like girls should be modest, but I mean, I think guys should be modest too. It's just not as talked about. Um, so the Bible is very clear on the, you know, kind of sexual empowerment movement. Um, and I think would heavily disagree with uh, saying any of those things above that, you know, porn would be liberating or something like that. Absolutely not. And then transgenderism, uh, that's too big of a topic to, to get into in this debate. So I have a picture of a little rabbit hole here because I don't want to go down that today. Um, but, you know, <laughs> it, it is something that should be talked about. And you see feminists, I think J.K. Rowling was canceled because she didn't um, approve of trans women entering into feminism. And she was canceled online, said horrible things about even though she's been a feminist for a long time. I think somebody was telling me that she opened a, a women's center or something like that that helped um, women in the UK. So like she, helped, she does a lot helped of help women, women. Mm -hmm. specifically biological women and not people who call themselves women. Yes, yes. Um, faced a lot of flack for that. So, um, you know, a rising issue and I think it will continue to be. Um, and so that brings us to kind of, so we've kind of answered like, what is feminism? Um, and you've probably now figured out whether, where you fall in line um, to some of these beliefs. But the second kind of portion of this talk I wanted to say were just some common objections that you might hear from a feminist, maybe directed at you as a Christian, um, some of those things you might hear. So the first one was, if you're not a feminist, you're a bad person or feminism is the morally right choice. Okay, Julian, how would you respond to that? Um, you had defined feminism as both, well, it's a, there's an ethical part of it. So the mm -hmm. ethics have not only the moral aspect, but the um, uh, empirical. empirical aspect. Yeah, mm -hmm. that needs evidence. So if you were, if someone were to say it's the morally right choice, but feminism is more of an ethical movement. They're kind of, um, they're missing out on the empirical aspect of it. So I'd ask them to fill in that and I'd say, where's yeah. your evidence? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or like, even if, even if they haven't even got to that point, you say like, what, what do you mean by feminist? Right. But yeah. Um, yeah, you have to show me that there's an issue before I can jump on your activism train, which is what right, you were saying. Right. Like, show me the evidence. I think, I think that's kind of what I have here. Um, yeah. What do you mean by feminist? How do you know it's right? Like, what is your framework for determining morality if you want to take it to a more uh, a kind of back out of the scope of feminism and talk more about, like, where does your morality come from in general? Um, and then maybe they're a Christian. You'd be like, so you mean that God wants us to become a feminist? Like, what? where in the Bible are you supporting these if um, you're a Christian? Something like that could could be a good framework. But I put this slide up here just to say that you're going to get a lot of different answers. So you always want to remember to clarify when you're talking. I mean, yeah. this is just apologetics rule 101. You've got to, to have any intellectual debate. You, you need to define your terms and understand what you're, you're saying because you could be defining things completely differently and arguing past each other. So yeah, what do you mean by that? Or what do I have to do? Or what do I have to believe to become a feminist is a great question. Um, to get into the, to drill down to the actual issues. Um, and it, remember, if they just say, oh, well, we're just fighting for equality between the sexes, say, okay, surely there has to be something else, because, like, I know the term egalitarianism, which is just saying, saying just that, how is feminism different from that? Because maybe I believe in egalitarian principles or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a good thing to point out. Um, and then if they give you a specific example, say like, OK, well, maybe I don't support that, but I support these other things. Can I still be a feminist? So really understand what they think you need to believe um, to become a feminist before you can talk about it. Um, yeah. What kind of feminism? Again, the location is really important. We talked about that before. If you're talking about Saudi Arabia um, versus, you know, the United States of America, there's two different cultures with two different issues. Um, so really clarify what you're talking, where are you talking about? And then again, what do you have to do or believe to become a feminist? 
um, is kind of the, the root behind some of these questions. All right, religion caused the patriarchy. Julian, you're up. <laughs> um, I'll start with the obvious. What do you mean by patriarchy? Yep. Um, but then as the conversation would go along, I'd probably ask the question, why would you want it to be a matriarchy, for example? Why do you sure. want the power? Um, when you were talking about the patriarchy earlier, I thought of this. Um, in the Bible, it does set up a patriarchy for sure, but it emphasizes over and over again that there's so much responsibility on the shoulders of the men and mm -hmm. so much that if they mess up, they are culpable for so much. Yeah. Um, and even outside the Bible, you can see that when people make decisions for a large group and things go wrong, mm -hmm. they're the scapegoat. They're the person yeah. that gets all the blame. So yeah. I don't understand why someone would want to put themselves in that position and risk uh, all that, all that, uh, I don't know, potential bad things happening to them, all that responsibility, um, if they're not of a sacrificial mindset, you know, if they just yeah. want it for the power or whatever, to make the world in their image. Um, I don't think they're looking too far ahead if they can't understand that there's going to be huge responsibilities with that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, if, if somebody says, like, we need to end the patriarchy, right? Well, what's your alternative to that? Is it a matriarchy? Right, is that right, actually right, what right. you want? Um, and, and they probably are going to say no to that, but but it's still a good point. Um, like, what? Yeah, okay, yeah. end it, replace it with what? We have to have some sort of system, right? I um, think, think, go ahead. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton, I think it was, who had a analogy of someone walking along a path and they come across a fence and it's the path that they've walked a ton of times before they like walking this path but now there's a fence in the way and they can't walk on the path but they want to tear down the fence because they want to keep walking on the path but before they do that they should understand what the purpose of the fence is there for mm -hmm. before they just tear it down so yeah. maybe for example there's a sinkhole that's appeared on the path and the the fence is protecting people from walking into that but if you just tear down the fence and keep on walking you walk right into the sinkhole yeah, so yeah. for things like this, we have a patriarchy in the society and feminists want to knock it down and put something else up. Mm -hmm. But before they try and do that, they should understand what's the purpose of this? What was it made mm -hmm. for? Yeah. Um, and I think they consistently fail to understand the actual reasons that it was made for. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's talking about it in like, you know, when God, you know, set up the family unit for a Christian family, you're saying that the father should be the head. Um, and that, yeah. that is an instance of, I guess, patriarchy in modern society. But I think when people right. say patriarchy, they often mean like the government is all men. It's only men that can make decisions and stuff like that, which yeah. that, that brings us to the key difference here. Um, when you, after you've defined your terms, what do you mean by that? Note that the modern definition says that men hold the power and women are excluded from it. The, Biblical definition of patriarchy, though, means the rule of fathers. It is not the rule of men. It mm -hmm. is the rule of men who have children to take care of. And like you were saying, like, why did God set up this fence in the road, if you will? What was he protecting people from? Well, given that, you know, in ancient Israel, specifically the Old Testament, um, it was a very agrarian culture where without crops, you could not feed your family. Um, and so God put the right. responsibility on managing those crops under the care of the men, or not the men, excuse me, the fathers um, of the household. And so um, that then enabled the family unit to flow a little better. Like somebody has to be the leader, right? You can't, not everybody mm -hmm. can be the leader. God picked the fathers right. um, and probably gave men certain gifts to enable them to do that a little bit better in the world, given that they are things like physically stronger as in general um than women so they were probably able to take care of the fields a little bit um more efficiently so that is something you really want to distinguish between um but again like you said you got to define what do you mean by patriarchy because if you mean like oh i don't like how god says that men should be the head of the household well that's a different conversation than oh i don't like how there's only men in the government and then mm -hmm. only men have ever been presidents in the United States, stuff like that. That's a different conversation. Okay. I think I have a couple more. Um, Christianity blames all sin on Eve. I'm going to just dispel that myth right now because Romans 5.12 says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. 
So death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. So no, it doesn't. <laughs> is a, yeah. is, is, and sometimes that's the answer to people like, you know, oh, you know, the Bible says this, this, and this. You're like, actually, no, it definitely doesn't. Um, yeah. and, and I think I think as Christians, it's really important to to say that when if somebody says something to you about that's false about the Bible, um, I think it is a responsibility to say actually no, it doesn't say that because then yeah. they're they're not understanding what actually the Bible says, and that's probably hindering them from from you know having a relationship with with God with Jesus. So. We're supposed to tear down every lofty argument brought up against the knowledge of God. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we talked about this a little earlier, but it says that somebody could say to you, Christianity says that women were created to be slaves. It says that men and women aren't equal. Julian, I know you I know you have some responses to this. Uh, so. Yeah. Well, I'll start with the obvious questions. What do you mean by equal? What do you mean by slave? Mm -hmm. Um what do you mean created to be slaves? Where do you mm -hmm. get that from? Where in the Bible yeah. does it say that? Um, I'd also say that the, the Hebrew word for um, helper, I think we use helper now in English in the translation. In the King James, it was helpmate. But mm. the actual Hebrew term is etzer, which I believe means the, the actual context makes it say helper who is equal. It's not just helper, like some subservient, you know, servant, but helper yeah. who is his equal. Yeah. Um, yeah. For sure. Uh, those were kind of the things I said. They, they could take it a couple different ways, right? So let's say they're talking about, you know, Adam, like you were saying, um, the creation of the woman as the helper. Um, my response to that would be helper is the same word used to describe the Holy Spirit when it was given to um, people at Pentecost. So mm -hmm. it's obviously not a diminishing term. I'm not saying women are like the Holy Spirit, but I'm saying helper does not mean unequal. Um, the Holy right. Spirit is part of God's trying nature. So obviously not diminishing. Um, also, it was said that man was incomplete without women. Um, if they're saying, oh, well, the Bible says that wives should submit to their husbands. Um, that is a whole debate, but I'd love to point out that it doesn't say that women should submit to men. It says mm -hmm. that wives who have chosen to marry a man, they are choosing to put themselves under the authority of that man, and they are therefore subjugating themselves to this command to submit themselves to their husband. That is not um, a blanket statement for all men and women in society. And then also remember, just kind of on the side, that like when it says submit, it doesn't mean you have to stay at home and cook and clean like 1950s style. <laughs> Housewife, um, the Proverbs 31 is uh, a role model for women in the Bible, and she was a businesswoman. It says she went out and saw that a field was good and bought it. You know, it didn't say she went and asked her husband if it's okay if I please get this. Can I have the credit card? <laughs> no, mm -hmm. she said she went out and made that decision for herself, and God said that was a good thing. And then just another note, um, yeah, once again, there is neither there is nor male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Um, so it's just saying that every human being has value and has the opportunity to have a relationship with um, Jesus. Right. Uh, also, uh, and just again, God, there were many different roles in the Bible um, that women fulfilled. So that is a couple of great counterpoints. But there's also, I mean, the, the husband for the command for wives to submit to their husband is still a discussion point. And I have a video for that. I'll, I'll break up in a second. And then the last one here, um, I heard this actually in a video, a girl said, I deserve not to walk through the parking lot at night with my keys and my knuckles. Julian, what do you say to that? Um, I, first I was gonna say, nobody deserves to feel fear for their lives, their physical lives. And there's a, I understand the um, the desire behind that for everyone to be peaceful and to live in safe safety, but there's nowhere that we're promised in the Bible or in real life. There's nowhere that we're uh, that we're promised complete safety all the time. Yeah. So to yeah. say that I deserve this thing or I deserve to be safe at this point, mm -hmm. no, you don't. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I you, really don't like it when people say I deserve something. You, right. you don't. Everything, you can, every good thing is a gift, right? You can prefer to be safe, and we would hope that you are safe, and we're going to yes. try to make sure that you're safe, but you don't deserve it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Also, 
is that the fault of the patriarchy or is it just the sinful nature of human beings to want to either mug you or, or do something worse in a parking lot at night? Um, yeah, that's probably, you know, it's probably going to be a man that attacks the woman, but mm -hmm. it could also be a woman. Yeah. It's not just going to be guys. Um, yeah. which is a shame. Absolutely. It's a shame yeah. that anybody would do that. I'm not, um, I'm not saying that men all of a sudden are totally okay <laughs> for attacking yeah. women in a parking lot at night. No. It's a terrible thing. Not <laughs> sure. excusing it, but it's we're not guaranteed to be safe from that all the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It 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 takes the the onus off of like we're not we're not saying anything about the other party that's doing the attacking. It's just saying you and your life, you're not guaranteed any form of safety. Um obviously right. like we would want to work for that as a society, but once again, remember that there is evil in the world and there's sin in the world. Um and that um, that can motivate people to do very horrible things, but it doesn't mean that you deserve yes. to be safe from that. Um, and there are, there are places that are bad enough that even men walk around with their keys in their knuckles. Yeah, absolutely. I've also heard that's a really bad self-defense technique. I don't know. Somebody else looked that up. I'm not an expert on. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to hurt somebody much unless you go for like their eyes or something. And okay. good luck with that. I good to Just know. carry a gun. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Yeah, my, my simple response with, to this was like, okay, that's great. Like, yeah, fine. Nobody wants to be attacked in the parking lot. How is feminism going to solve this problem? Like, what what Good are question. you putting forth? And that gets you to the issue of what they're saying should and shouldn't be in society. And from there, you can have a deeper conversation. So that kind of brings us to the end of this conversation. I hope, I hope everybody listening kind of now has a better idea of what feminism entails. It's kind of a, a weighty word and it's definitely very popular right now um, and also very unpopular in some circles. So hopefully this brings you some clarity into that terminology and also gives you um, some tools to talk to people who maybe consider themselves feminist. Um, to, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I have some extra resources here. I know Jolene's gonna put them in the notes. Um, some just some interesting videos and some resources that kind of expand on what we were talking about. And then, yeah, Julian, you were going to say something? Yeah, um, to finish out, you had mentioned a couple times where feminism is different in one country versus another, and you can call yourself a feminist in one country and not another. You had mentioned the other night about, I think was it a, maybe it wasn't you, I don't know, someone mentioned a Nigerian woman who, mm -hmm. like, maybe was, was that you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so go ahead, uh, say that part. Sure. Yeah, I watched a video of a woman, um, and she was Nigerian's TED Talk on YouTube, got millions and millions of views. Um, and she talked about the ways that she was raised um, in her household in Nigeria. Um, she talked about how the boys were treated differently than the girls. Like she was taught to cook and clean, and the boy, you know, mm -hmm. he got sat around and watched TV or whatever after dinner, where she had to do the chores cause, just because she was a girl. Um, and there were other examples too of her being. Um, I guess discriminated against in that society and I mean initially as a Christian listening to that I was like I don't like this I don't I don't like feminism like I don't like this victimhood mentality but at the same time like actual discrimination does happen in the world and I think right. Christians can get in trouble when you start painting with broad strokes and saying oh no just because this doesn't happen yeah. Amer in America doesn't mean it doesn't happen anywhere else so that was a really interesting video it might be in the in the links that I had but um, yeah, she was, she was a very eloquent speaker. I didn't necessarily agree with everything that she said, but, um, she is, a, a kind of a feminist scholar and, and a pioneer for, um, her country in Africa. Cool. 